in the book of Acts, Acts chapter number four, um, we're going we're gonna to pick up the story uh, at, at, in verse number one, but you really, to really understand what's going on, uh, you have to go read chapter three. So um, we don't have time. I got to do all this in 35 minutes. And how many folk know this is hard for pastor to do, to talk about 25 years in 35 minutes. And so, so this may not be the last time, last message. This, this may be a series. That's what I'm trying to say. Y'all all right with that? Okay, and so, so in, in Acts chapter 3, uh, Peter and John were going into the temple to pray. There was a lame man that had been lame um, from, from birth. He could not walk. So, so they would carry him and lay him at the temple gate, and he would beg. And people would give him money because they felt sorry for him because he was lame. And so this particular day, Peter and John was going into that temple, and they passed right by the man. And the man um, was doing what he did. He was begging. And Peter looked at him and said, uh, look at us. Give me your attention. He said, the man looked thinking, I'm about to get some money. And Peter said, silver and gold, I don't have. But what I do have, I'm going to give that to you. He said, in the name of Jesus, of Nazareth. I just want y'all to, to, to know who I'm talking about. I didn't say in the, in the name of God. I said in the name of Jesus, I want you to rise up and walk. Peter took this man's hand, lifted him up. The Bible says the man received strength in his ankle bones. Come on now. Have y'all seen somebody that couldn't walk from their mother's womb? And so all of a sudden, he grabs the hand and says, uh, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And the man started rising. And then the man, not only did he rise, but he started walking. The Bible said he started leaping, and the Bible said he started praising God. And, the, you know, word get out. And so the people found out. And when they found out, they ran to Peter and the John trying to figure out, we know this man couldn't walk. But now he's walking. And Peter opened his mouth and started preaching the gospel. And he told the story of how y'all crucified Jesus, went all the way back to the Old Testament. Every prophet prophesied that this was going to happen, and so don't think we did nothing. It's not by our deeds, but this man is able to walk because of the faith in the name <laughs> of Jesus. And so by the time we get to chapter 4, the church done heard about it. These are leaders in the church. These are people that the high priests, they control everything in religion in Jerusalem. Are y'all with me? And so you only have one high priest. And so when they found out, they came and arrested him. And they, they set him to the side. Uh, and the Bible says in verse number four, it was many that heard him, they believed. And it was about 5,000 men going somewhere. When God says something, when God sends something, when God does something, you can't stop it. You, you can't stand in the way. Y'all just sung, um, he, God made a way. Somehow. And it's that somehow. <laughs> because we know he's going to make a way. When he said that he was going to make a way, we just don't know somehow. But we know he's going to make a way. It came to pass in verse 5 when the rulers, Annas the high priest, verse 6, 
uh, Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. When they had set them in the midst, they asked, verse 7, by what power or by what name have you done this? Because we know the man couldn't walk. Verse number 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means he is made whole, made whole, be it known unto you all and to all people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you hold. Now you got to understand, these are the same people that Peter was afraid of. He denied even knowing Jesus because he feared what would happen to him from them. But now something has changed. And Peter's looking dead at the people who, has, who, who he was afraid of before, and he was saying, hold on now. Um, it ain't nothing that we did, but it was in the name. And I'm preaching right now in the name. If Antioch is going to be Antioch, we can't stop preaching in the name. We can't finish we can't finish away from where he started us from. In other words, what he told us to do then, he's still telling us to do now. He said, the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become, he has become the head of the corner. Neither, now this, this, is, this is your operative verse here in verse 12. I read all that to get right here. He said, neither is there salvation in any other. Church, listen to me good. I, I did say I wanted the folk who were, who were outside, if you ain't doing what, you know, working, come on inside because you need to hear this. The church needs to hear this. There is no salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. And so I want to teach to you from the subject today, and I, I know I'm not going to finish, uh, but I want to talk about, uh, from, uh, to you today, the Savior, the servant, the sacrifice. The Savior, the servant, servant rather, and the sacrifice. sacrifice. Say Savior, savior. Servant, servant, sacrifice. sacrifice. Now, we're going to answer two questions. There are a whole lot of churches out there. Bunch of them. Why this one? Why, why this one? The one you're sitting in now. The one y'all watching. You, have, you got many other churches. Why? Why this one? So, so, in other words, why is Antioch in existence? Why are we here? What are we doing? I mean, could we... Hey, the saints playing the cowboys today. I mean, we have a lot of places that we can be. Come on now, they probably got a sale somewhere. But, but why, why are you here? Why, why, why this church? Why pass a few of them to get to this one? It's going to get good up in here. Because you and I need to understand why this church is in existence. 
why God called this one. Now, so, <laughs> yeah. so the first question is, why this church? Why, why Antioch? Why are you in this church right now? Why are you a member of this church? The answers may shock you. Number one, you have to be led by the Spirit to be here. I did not say you have to like the people to be here. I did not say it's right around the corner from my house. I, I, I did not say, oh, I just love the choir. I love the word. I love to hear him say, no, you have to, number one, be what? Led by the Spirit. And the Spirit knows all things. So if you're led by the Spirit to come here, he knows all the people that's here. So you can't say that God led me here and then I ran into sister so-and-so who had a bad attitude that day and now God's going to lead me somewhere else. God made you. He knows exactly what you need. And so the Spirit led you here. Money didn't lead you here. If it did, when the money dries up, you out of here. I'm here today because the servant told me to serve. I am here today because my Savior told me to be here. Boy, it's going to get good in a minute. And so, so, so that's the first question. Uh, why are you in this church? Did the Spirit of God lead you here? Because if the Spirit of God didn't lead you here, you ain't going to stay. Whenever, when, see, you, that's the reason. That's not the benefit. Some people come to church to be with their friends. It's a benefit. Ain't nothing wrong with being with your friend. Some people come to church because they're dating somebody and they feel like I need to be in her church in order to get some favor with her. But then, but then when the word comes down your road and you start screaming and squirming and, 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 and she stopped putting out, come on somebody, because all of a sudden she got holy and the word hit her and she stopped doing all the stuff you like to do. Then all of a sudden you out the door. We got to find us another church. We going to clean up a whole lot of stuff. Been here for 25 years. We got a lot of work to do. So, so why come to Antioch? What, what's the deal with Antioch Christian Church? Why come here? Because you were led by the Spirit. I was led by the Spirit. We are no different. The church started in our living room because the Spirit of God led me to do it. Didn't have a dime. Not a dad. Nobody, nobody uh, uh, planted us. What God did here, I, I'm glad I didn't overthink it. I, I let people talk me out of it. I was just stubborn enough. And I loved God enough to where I didn't care what anybody said. I knew what he told me to do. Even my wife, she was, my wife is very intellectual. She, she went to uh, school. She's highly educated. Magna cum laude. Amen. Who graduates in three years? I mean, four years, a four-year institution. It took me six. And so I was, thank you, laude. But she was. <laughs> Can I get a witness up in here? So, so, <laughs> so, 
But she say, why don't, why don't you go to school? She said, I believe God called you. No doubt. Won't you go to school? Won't you get your, let's get your, just sit up on the, go to church, sit up on another pastor. Uh, and then just see how it works out. And I know she meant well. She did. She, and what she probably was really saying, you ain't going to be embarrassing me. You know, <laughs> I'm married to you, okay? You ain't going to be embarrassing me out there. So I ain't never even heard you teach. I ain't heard you, what do you mean God called you pastor? That's probably what she meant. But I, I, I knew she meant well, and, and, and I just say that's not what God said. That's not what he said. He told me exactly what to do, and I followed those instructions. And, and when I said that to her, uh, she said, well, you tell me whatever I need to do to help you, and I'm going to help you. And so I was working full time, had a full time job in corporate America, making good money. She was making good money. Um, and our first church service was September of 19, 1999. I'm at church, I mean, at work, sitting in the, uh, it was a, a meeting with the whole company, really. Our senior VP uh, was speaking to the employees, and he was speaking from this podium. Now, I'm talking about a Fortune 500 company, and you've got executives, uh, you've got managers, You've got just regular employees, super, you know, you got everybody in, the, in there. And he's speaking from this podium. I'm sitting uh, in the audience, really not paying attention uh, to what he's saying because I'm just trying to get back to work. You wasted my time. And um, while I'm sitting there, the Lord says, I want you to go up to him when he finishes and tell him, uh, that you're going to preach from this podium this Sunday morning. And I act like I didn't hear God. <laughs> because you, I'm not about to get shamed. This man don't even know me. He's the senior VP, way up there. Why, how am I going to go and say that to him? The reason this is here is to show you that when God says something, He's a way maker. We didn't have a podium. I told God, I want a podium. But we don't have the money to get a podium. And I forgot that I had mentioned that to God. But if I'm going to be a pastor, can I at least get a podium? We, we, had, a, we had a little band stand. That was it, a little black band stand. I was like, ain't nobody going to take me serious <laughs> preaching from a bandstand. Got to have a podium. And, and, and um, the Lord said, I want you to go tell him that this is your podium and that you're going to preach from this <laughs> Sunday. And so I tried to ignore God. I ain't saying that. Not doing it, I ain't saying it. And y'all, anybody been, you can't ignore God? Y'all been there? And so he stayed on me. Then I said, okay. I'm going to go up here and do that. So I waited after the meeting. Everybody leaving, shaking hands. So I walk up, and his name is Bob Penland. Just so you know, this, ain't a, this, this is a real testimony. This ain't a testimony. I named name Bob Penland. He's the senior VP of the Associates when I worked there. Subsidiary of Ford Motor Company. And a motor credit. And so... Um, I walked up to Bob Penn and I say, uh, sir, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm Norris McGill. And uh, I just started a church. And I say, God told me to tell you that this is my podium. <laughs> and then I'm going to preach from it on Sunday. And he chuckled and laughed. He said, I am a deacon wow. in the Baptist church. He said, we just ordered a new podium. He said, you can have this, and you can take it home today. He said, if you got a truck, you can come get it today. 
I, I didn't say it to him, but I said, I ain't got a truck, but I'm taking it home today. Because if God provided this, then he going to provide the means to get it home. And so this is here just as a physical reminder of God's provision. And so uh, we went from here to here. We were at Day Spring Family Church, and we didn't have a building. We had to move suddenly. It's crazy how we had to move out the building that we had at Country Club. Muslim guys, this was before 9-11, they, they could care less about our Jesus. And so they gave us an ultimatum. We stood up to the ultimatum and said they didn't think we would leave. They thought we would cough up the money. No, we would rather just leave. Now, I don't know where we're going. Don't know, I don't know where we're going to have Bible study. Are y'all listening? I told the church, I don't know where we're going. I don't know where we're going to have Bible study. But when I find out, I'll let you know. If this is a church of God, then God's going to provide a place for us to have church. We're not doing anything wrong. We're not breaking the law. We're, we're, we're people of integrity. Uh, this is just an attack. And so one Sunday, the last Sunday that, that we were there, we told the church we were moving right after service that particular Sunday. And so the church came together and we started moving. And so as I, as I walk into my office in that building, my wife and I are in that office, uh, Bishop Dickerson and his wife, uh, Pastor Sonia came, they, they didn't, we hadn't talked to them, they didn't know anything about what was going on. They, they came into our office and they said, we don't know what's going on. But we couldn't sleep. We didn't even go to lunch. Right after our service, we, we rushed over here. And this man said to me, he said, if you need a place to have service, you can use our entire church. Our church is open to you. And I'm like, before our foot left that property, God had already, had already sent and made provision. And I boy, that pride in me, I almost said, Bishop will find another way because I don't want to inconvenience your church and your staff by us coming in and kind of throwing, you, throwing your ministry uh, off kilter. But I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> And my wife was there with me, boy, you better take, you better say, you better say, this is, you might have said that before I could say anything, just because you knew what I was thinking. And, um, and so when we, when I used the, when we used that, that sanctuary, and we talked about it uh, in our interview, uh, he had, boy, he had a nice podium. It looked better than this one. <laughs> he had a really nice podium. It had their name on it, had their logo Man, I like preaching from here. You know, it, it was feeling, you know, when you drive a good car and, and you then you have to get back in yours. <laughs> it was like, man, this feels good up here. Have some room, could spread my Bible out, you know. And, um, and I, I remember saying to the Lord, Lord, um, I want a nice podium. And the Lord said, um, just write a check for it. See, I'm going I'm to tell y'all how God works. When you don't have a check, he'll give you one. But when you have a check, he'll touch your heart. And he'll speak to you and tell you what to purchase. And so, so God gave us, we, we, we started preaching from this one. And I still like this podium. As a matter, that's probably my favorite podium. Um, just from the aesthetics. Uh, but our audio team say, Pastor, uh, the glass messes with the sound, so can you just get a podium without glass? So that's why we got, we got this one. My point is, my, they, and they say they think. And so the point is, uh, God took us from here to here to here. And now I'm saying, God, I want to build it. 
God, God, I want land. And I wanted it, I'm going to tell you, I wanted it before COVID. But had we bought it before COVID, we wouldn't have it now. And so God stepped in and said, just like I provided the podium, just, just like I provided the provision, I will provide the building and the land because I want my children to be housed. And, and so, so the same God that was with us then is the same God that's with us now. And so I'm going to ask you again, why any of y'all? Number one, I was led by the Spirit. Number two, I have something to give. You're here because you have something to give. There's nobody in this church that does not have something to give. Now, y'all got the question? What's the first question? Why, why any of y'all? Why this church? Number one, I was led by the Spirit. Number two, have something to get so there are no big members. There are no small members. We just members. Right? And so we all have something uh, to give. Second question we're going to answer today, uh, why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do? Um, why do you do what you do, Pastor? And this, this is going to get personal. And, and so I'm going to say, why do I do what I do? And I do what I do, number one, because of the Savior. Because of the Savior. I'm old school. So I thank God that I have a house that I have uh, cars, uh, that, that I have uh, nice things, quality things. But that's not why I serve it. I do what I do because he saved me. And I needed to be saved. My life was in ruin. And I needed a savior. And God sent me a savior. And his name is Jesus. And so if you have a problem with Jesus, you ain't going to be a part of this ministry for long. Because I do what I do because of the savior. Jesus saved me. I was going straight to hell. My life was in shambles. I'm talking about I was living bad. I was speaking bad. I was acting bad. I was thinking bad. But the Savior looked at me in my bad state and still saved me. It is personal with me. So I don't need to ask God for a bigger house. I don't need to ask God for all these things. I thank him that he's going to bless me with it when he gets ready, but that's not why I serve him. The reason that I served him, he's the Savior. He saved my soul. Nothing ever will eclipse that. Everything you have is going to pass away. It's going to decay. It's going to rot. It ain't going to be here. They playing a football game. Y'all can tell this on my mind. They playing a football game at AT&T Stadium. That's a nice stadium. One day, that stadium going to be gone. But my soul <laughs> is spending eternity uh, with the king. And so there are three things that the Savior did for me. Number one, letter A, he called me. He called me. This was a revelation to some of the pastors. Um, I was wrestling. Did he save me and then he called me? Or did he call me and save me? He, he, he called me 
before he saved me. He called me because I knew I was called, but I wasn't saved. I wasn't trying to act saved, but I knew I was called. I felt the tug when I was 12 years old. God placed me on a path. I knew it, but I wasn't acting safe. So he, so he called me. Then he saved me, letter B. Then letter C, he sent me. He called me. He saved me. And then he sent me. I'm standing here because I'm sent. Now, can y'all indulge me for three minutes? I'm needing my chair. Here, here is the big problem. Here's the big problem. Huge problem. Um, the Lord wants me to warn this church to not become entitled Christians. An entitled Christian thinks that the church owes them something. This came from the Spirit of the Lord. Yes, sir. And, and so there has to be a different attitude, yes, a different motivation, a different thinking for Christians so that they don't feel entitled, that the church owe them something. The, uh, there were two men that went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, one was a, was a, a beggar, a sinner. And the Pharisee prayed with himself. But the sinner wouldn't even look up. The Pharisee felt entitled. But the sinner needed grace. Needed mercy. And so when I'm entitled, I don't appreciate my church and the service that goes into me walking into a cool building. See, when I'm entitled, and, and I felt this way myself, so I'm not, I'm not putting anybody on blast. You just expected the church to be there and to do everything you needed the church to do without ever saying thank you. Without ever appreciating whoever unlocked the door. Somebody, somebody had the back it. Somebody had to clean the bathroom. Somebody had to make sure the lights was on. So, somebody had to make sure that the air conditioner was working. Somebody had to make sure that the pictures were down low. But when I'm entitled, I just come in and expecting all that to be done. And then if it ain't done perfect and right, I got a problem with it. Because I'm now entitled as a Christian. We, we don't listen. We don't appreciate. We don't say thank you enough. Let me just say that. We don't say thank you enough. I said this this morning. The greeters didn't have to show up. They didn't have to have a smile. Nobody made them come. They made a choice to be here and to smile and to greet us with open arms and an open heart. How many people said thank you to the greeters? How many people said thank you to the people that clean the church? How many, how many people say thank you to the folks standing out in the hot sun? Making sure that you're able to park where you park. But do I walk up in here entitled checking out the house of God when my own, own house ain't clean? My own house ain't clean, and I'm in here checking out the house of God. Now, God told me to say it. We have to be careful 
that we are not entitled Christians. Peter fell into that trap because he thought the Jews were better than the Gentiles. And so when the Jews were around, Peter, didn't, he didn't hang around the Gentiles. He just hung around the Jews because Jews don't have nothing to do with Gentiles. Because I'm entitled. But then Paul showed up. And so he said, how are you going to preach grace when you are a respecter of person? Did not the same God pour out the Holy Ghost on the Gentiles, the same Holy Ghost that the Jews have? So God is no respecter of persons. So why is the church divided now? Why, why we got Christians now against Christians? Because somebody feels entitled. So I do what I do because of number one, the what? And then number two, because of the servant. Here's the problem. Who's sitting on your throne? Yeah, they got a picture up here somewhere. It's coming. Is, is it up there already? So I'm being transparent. When you sit on your throne, then you're entitled. When you sit on your throne, then you make your own decision. When, when you sit on your throne, you can leave a church that the Spirit of God led you to. Because you you sitting in this, this place that Jesus only... See, is he Savior or is he Lord and Savior? See, when you Lord... I don't care what that pastor said. I, I, don't care, I don't care what the preacher preaches. Because you Lord. And you're sitting on your own throne. And when you sit on your own throne, you can't save yourself. As a matter of fact, when you sit on your own throne, you lose vision. Because you can only see what you want to see. You can only feel what you want to feel. And so here, men, listen to me. Pride keeps us right here. God spoke to your heart, but your pride said, I ain't changing. I'm going to stay the same. That's for somebody else when you know that was for you. I preach here every Sunday. Every Sunday I hear the Holy Ghost say this person, that person, they need to come up for prayer. But because sitting on my own throne, I stay there and keep my family oppressed. My children don't get the blessing that God meant from, uh, them to receive from their father and through their father because I refuse to get off the throne. See, see, when you get off the throne, it's not my will, but Lord, your will be done. We was riding the church this morning. I said, uh, honey, I finally figured out why, why we didn't quit. And I'm going to tell you why we haven't quit. We've had a whole lot of reasons. Many times I thought about uh, let me go back into corporate America. I, can, I feel like I can make a half a million dollars. I really do. That's, I, I just think like that. I think I can be a millionaire right now. <laughs> but that's me. <laughs> but I really don't. Do I have to put up with all of this? Do I have to go through all the persecution? Do I have to live in a glass house? 
where everybody knows all of my business all the time? Lord, do I really have to do that? I'm on the throne, but when I get off, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. When, when I get off the throne, um, God said, I want you to go tell the man. That's your photo. That's pretty bold. When I get off of my throne, nevertheless. See, when you're on the throne, you can quit. But when you get off the throne, you can't quit until you finish. And, and while we haven't quit in 25 years, see, and can I be transparent? I'm, I'm 25 years in the pastoring, and I still get back on here sometimes. Ain't nobody going to pray with me. I still, because I got a flesh. Be because I'm still growing. I, not that I have attained, but, but what I do, I forget those things that are behind, but I do what I press toward the mark of the high calling of God. Now, I'm not there yet, so sometimes I get back on the throne. But I'm smart enough to get back off again so that God can keep working on me and working in me. And so I'm here today to tell you, some of you need to get back off of that throne. You've been sitting on it too long, and you're holding back the blessing of God over your life because he's Savior, but he's not Lord. The difference between men and women. Pride keeps a man right here. Emotions keep a woman right here. Because I'm going to sit in my feelings. I'm just going to sit in my feelings. And the Lord said, you in my seat. Get out of my chair. You, when you, listen, when you gave your life to me, then you gave your life to me. Do y'all know the stuff I can post? If I was on this throne, brother, I got a whole lot of stuff to say about the state of, of <laughs> but I have to get off for the throne because the Lord said, don't say that. Don't treat them like that. Don't behave that way. And so... He'll, he literally takes the sword out of my hand when I'm off the throne. But when I'm on the throne, get in the way. And I, I listen, I can do a whole lot of beating. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm saying? If I had a sword in my hand. And I ain't talking about cutting you literally. Okay, let me take that back. I'm talking about with my mouth. I can say a lot. Are we all right? Amen. And so, the Savior, the servant, the sacrifice. So we're going to talk about the servant and the sacrifice when we come back. My time is up, and I thank you for you. We are going somewhere. And we are not going to look back because I know why I'm here. I know.